Good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, closing plenary of the 19th East Asia Summit. I'm Robert Greenhill, a Managing Director and Chief Business Officer of the World Economic Forum. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce in just a moment uh, this great panel after what's been two very exciting days. We've had the opportunity with uh, five heads of state providing dynamic and, and very interesting perspectives on the region and their own countries. We've had more than 500 uh, delegates from 40 different countries providing a rich set of views from the private and public sector and also from civil society. And now is our opportunity to say, what do we take away from this in terms of learning? What does this mean in terms of uh, priorities uh, for ASEAN and Asian leadership going forward? And to start off with that, Franz Müller, as a um, member of the management board of uh, Metro and one of our co-chairs, what were your key takeaways from the last couple of days? Yes, I, had, um, I have a lot of key takeaways, but I will, regarding key, will be very selective. Uh, first of all, I had an, um, a great uh, couple of days here, and in all the working groups, uh, a lot of energy, commitments, and learnings. And um, we all read about the tremendous growth in Asia, how Asia handled the crisis, the growth within ASEAN. Um, but if you're working with the people, and if you're communicating with the people in the groups, it's even more impressive. And I just remember uh, the quote of uh, Kun Pitsuan, the, the director of ASEAN, who said, looking at the situation in Europe at the moment, he said that Europe uh, forgot the lessons taught to Asia in 1997. Uh, and I think he's very much right there. And I think we have to be very humble as European, and I'm a European myself, about how Asia now is handling uh, very correctly uh, the crisis here in Asia and still managing uh, this growth. So first of all, uh, uh, a humble feeling and a respectful feeling for all, everything heard here, but also at the, at the same time you see a lot of potential. And uh, coming then to the takeaways, uh, three takeaways for me. One takeaway is that uh, there is not only enormous growth uh, in Asia itself, but also in ASEAN as a group. And I think we talked a number of things about uh, the, the difference between the Asia as a total and ASEAN as a selective group. And in all the, in all the groups where we were, we saw an immense uh, volume of opportunities between those countries. And I think we hinder ourselves by not having open trade relationships within ASEAN, like we also hinder ourselves not having open trade relationships between Asia and Europe. And being a trader myself, this is uh, against my DNA. And I think uh, we also lose a lot of opportunities there. The second thing is um, we worked quite a lot uh, on food, food supply chain, food safety, sustainability of the total value chain of food. Uh, and this we did uh, very concretely with the Vietnamese uh, group and on Vietnam and with the Vietnamese government. Um, and there also, of course, we have a lot of uh, challenges in the supply chain and in waste and in water and in all these kinds of things which come to us if you would like to, and, uh, would like to grow a business. But if you really are concrete with partners along the table, the public sector, the private sector and NGOs, you find solutions. And uh, as an example, the Prime Minister or the, the, the Agricultural Minister of Vietnam came with a very 10 points plan for the coming 10 years. Uh, and we really started now with a working group, uh, which is kicking off next week, with very concrete actions. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was also a good learning, that if people are committed and people are talking very realistic about the problems, then you also can find solutions. And we have really effect-based uh, effect proof there. And the third thing is uh, talking about sustainability green technologies and all these kinds of things, that in a number of working groups, we also talk about sustainability, green, as being a price increase effect. And I think there we have to be uh, quite honest to ourselves. I think we have no choice, that's one thing. And the second thing is we sometimes also completely deny all the efficiencies we have already in our system, which can finance those so-called price increases. And if you see what, what, what kind of waste we have in the food supply chain in Asia, 30 to 40%, and we don't talk about these kind of things sometimes, but it's a huge opportunity cost to invest in technology and to make sure that you can finance the technology out of those opportunity costs. So those were the, a couple of learnings as, an, as a key selection. And, and this, this idea of the intra-ASEAN trade, not just export outside but yeah. within, and the link through an improved integrated logistics system, how does that feed back to the food challenge or food opportunity with wastage? Yeah, it's, it's a very clear relationship. Um, we see, if you look at Asia, and um, we, we operate our stores in Asia, but we also buy in Asia for Europe. 
uh, you see that there is, uh, because the countries do not have an open trade system with each other, uh, that the demand is not 100% coordinated, not from a customer side, not from a commodity side. So you have in some countries overproduction, uh, which is uh, destroyed because there is no customer or no system or no infrastructure. And in some countries there is a shortage, as well as within ASEAN, as well as between Asia and Europe. And I think if you have an open trade system there, then you can really transport goods, and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, huge distances, but sometimes only crossing one border only, and if we have a better coordination and better discussion about this, I think we can reduce waste, we can uh, get better prices to farmers, and sometimes you only talk about the farmer kilos, uh, the kilos the farmer sold, or the tons, uh, but if you look at the, the difference between the tons sold and the ton produced, we have a huge delta. And this is, this we cannot afford also, by the way, for the future, 50% uh, more production we need to feed the population in the future. So we have to get the inefficiencies out, have a coordination from the demand side, um, be very concrete with countries what they could produce, and this is not only a government thing, but also a private sector issue. And working together, I see a big coordination. And if you see then, within Asian, uh, the, the level in agriculture, fruit and vegetable sector, the volume of trade is rather limited. Uh, the total trade is getting big, uh, especially if you look at China. But if you look at, uh, the, within the Asian countries, the volume of trade is rather limited. And if you compare this, with the European system with a little bit more open borders, there's, there's a much higher percentage of trade. I think we have a big opportunity in ASEAN and uh, we should pick this up because there is a demand to have higher productivity and more output, for example, in agriculture. And the second thing is we miss out opportunities. And, and Himat Narukar, as Managing Director of Tata Steel and also one of our co-chairs, what were your key takeaways from the last couple of days? I think uh, two, three thoughts which stuck me and I thought I'll share that with you. I shared some of it in the innovation small group discussions what we had. You know, last two days it's very clear that Asia is on the growth path. All countries are doing well. The A brick term which was used and that's really true. And the economic growth rates are quite good. As a result of this, there is going to be a prosperity. There is going to be a disposable income. And I have just recently seen some study about India, and I'm sure it is true for everybody else. What it shows that by 2030, the infrastructure requirements in India, <coughs> that was the subject. And similar thing if it happens all over the ABRIC countries. We have seen only 20% of the infrastructure what it is today. The 80% is yet to come. So uh, infrastructure, power, housing, Everything it happens the same way it has happened in the developed world. We don't have that many resources on the current earth to do that. Which means that there has to be a wave of innovation and a wave of different thinking to give the similar facilities at half or even 30% of the material usage what has happened earlier. I think that's a big challenge in front of all the corporations, governments, all the research institutes. And that's something we have to do. The second thing, because of the prosperity, what is going to happen is the gap between the poor and the rich within the nations is likely to go up, and that gives its own other problems. So how can one do the growth by inclusive growth, by at least giving some basic level of education, proper drinking water, and some basic health facilities to all the people so that the people who do not immediately benefit are not at least against the development. That's the second challenge we have. Third challenge is on an immediate front, how everybody remains environmentally conscious. Because unless each one of us develops that mindset, I don't think again, we will be able to control the uh, environment the way we are looking forward to it. And fourth thing, which is a bit of a philosophical, but I see that with this prosperity, the ability or propensity to spend among in the young people is likely to be more than the ability to earn. If you uh, go around any Asian city or any other city, you find lots of branded goods, branded clo uh, clothes, all sorts of things which cost you a lot. So the propensity to spend is more, ability to earn will not match, which might give rise to some sort of a moral or the ethical issues. 
and how I am not a social scientist and I really don't have a immediate solution but how does one cope with that is something we'll have to see so these are the four issues which I can see with among, along with the development yeah very important the, the fact that with the growth the question is what are the overall limits and how do we actually have growth that's sustainable and this issue is growth without justice sustainable in terms of, of people seeing it generally and it actually came up as I recall in one of the sessions on, on looking at transportation systems that say if you have liberalization without actually infrastructure that allows the, the benefits to be shared across the country, it may actually allow certain key ports and others to benefit, but the hinterland will actually remain removed. So in fact, this issue of how do you actually achieve the, the benefits more broadly is one of the, the, the key challenges. So lots of opportunities, but also real challenges. Now, Ibumari, you are able to both see the, the opportunities and be responsible for managing the challenges. What, what do you see as, as the key priorities? Uh, well, I think uh, if I may talk a little bit about ASEAN, because I think uh, what's happening uh, with uh, post-global crisis, uh, with the center of gravity, if you like, uh, shifting to Asia, uh, we have China and India, uh, obviously, as uh, very much uh, on the radar screen. Uh, but we also think that Southeast Asia or ASEAN uh, is, should be the third uh, growth center or growth area uh, that people should focus on. Uh, because we are, if you take collectively, it's a 600 million uh, population market. Uh, trade has more than doubled uh, in the last six years, uh, including services trade. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot happening here. And Indonesia being the largest country uh, in Southeast Asia uh, is obviously uh, very much at the center of that. And we can see all the numbers showing that uh, post-global crisis, uh, the region uh, grew positively or those who did experience contraction came out of it uh, much more quickly uh, as well. Uh, and as I mentioned at lunchtime, actually if you look at either the European numbers or the American numbers, uh, ASEAN is just as important market for America or Europe as China and India. So uh, it, it's really uh, looking at Asia as, as many uh, growth areas and a, an increasingly integrated uh, in terms of trade, investment, uh, and even uh, potentially uh, flows of people. Uh, because we are uh, in this uh, integration exercise, starting with the ASEAN Economic Community, which uh, at the position of 2010, 99% of the tariffs are already at zero for most of intra-ASEAN trade. So you're already going uh, into the behind the border, uh, across the border issues of trade facilitation. One of the big exercises we are doing is the ASEAN single window, uh, called, uh, single window for export and import procedures. Uh, and also uh, ASEAN logistics, integrated logistics by 2015, which is the next big challenge, uh, which is really bringing in, uh, I think in, in the real way, uh, we are not lo no longer talking about what to do, but how to do it, you know, how to really achieve uh, true uh, economic integration. And the challenges are obvious uh, there, uh, starting from, I think, uh, ensuring that your regulatory framework is going to support uh, this. Uh, and we have gone through uh, quite a big exercise in Indonesia for the national single window uh, exercise, and it requires political will at the highest level. Uh, it, it requires uh, champions of reform. It requires institutional and uh, uh, institutional reforms. It requires bureaucratic reforms, which was the most one of the most difficult ones uh, that we had to do. Uh, and one of the things we did was to identify customs as uh, one of the first ones to be uh, reformed in terms of the bureaucracy, including increasing remuneration, for instance. So these are some of the, you know, once you have a target, I think targets are important, uh, externally driven targets that you internalize uh, to your domestic policy. And that, I think, is, is the climate for reforms that will continue uh, in the next five years, uh, especially when we are looking at the ASEAN economic integration exercise. I mean, the other thing I would mention is that there's a lot in ASEAN that's going on, and we have this 2015 uh, ASEAN economic community deadline. But at the same time, uh, we are also integrating with China, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, India, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, with ASEAN China already being completed uh, on the good side as of this year. And if you take ASEAN plus China, it's the biggest uh, free trade area in the world, I think. Uh, 
nine billion people, and it's this, in, in terms of economic size, it's the second biggest one, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So it's it's large, and and uh, we have the numbers to to show that increasing integration is happening. What helped Indonesia during the global crisis and in the recovery is growth of our exports were increasingly coming from uh, Asia. And the changing pattern of intra-regional trade is also very interesting to note. It's no longer the production-based network kind of uh, uh, trade pattern, but it's increasingly because of the con increasing consumer market, uh, size of market, increasing mi middle class, increasing purchasing power uh, of, uh, of the region. Uh, which will uh, drive it uh, uh, into the future uh, also uh, as sources of growth. So uh, I think uh, moving forward, I would say the takeaway I had from my, 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 not my whole two days here, but my whole day today here uh, and listening to all of you is that I think it's, we, we all know uh, in a way what to do. Now let's focus on how to do it in terms of how, what governments need to do, how, what, what inputs from the private sector and how uh, this can all be uh, really uh, prioritized, if you like, uh, to achieve uh, what we want to achieve. And if um, we were going to get together, and you know, I have a special reason for asking this, if we were going to get together in a year to see what progress we've made on that, how, and this audience was going to uh, hold the leaders here to task as to whether there's been progress, what would be the kind of things one should look for a year from now to show that there's been momentum in some of these key priorities? I think uh, if you look at the, all this uh, benchmarking uh, of uh, including your enabling trade uh, index uh, report, I think it focused on uh, infrastructure yeah. as uh, one of the perhaps less than uh, good performances and uh, administration of uh, border measures. So uh, uh, I think the, the quick win, we have to identify quick wins. I think administration at, at the border. So. Uh, cross-border measures, you can still make a lot of improvement uh, there. Uh, and here, actually, in, in our session on open borders, uh, there was a lot of discussion on how actually uh, companies can contribute. And uh, we had a sort of a good session of learning, uh, learning by doing. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, national, when we did the national single window, it was a lot of learning by doing. Uh, what, what works for Indonesia may not necessarily work uh, for other countries, uh, but what, work, what worked for Singapore doesn't necessarily work for Indonesia, you know. Logistics is a big challenge for a big country uh, like Indonesia. But I think what's important is movement in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, and uh, even if we make mistakes, uh, we recognize it and then how do we correct it uh, going forward. Very good. So in fact, some, some very major trends from exports out of the region to the opportunity within the region from tariff reduction, which actually to a large extent has been achieved over the last 10 years, to actual trade facilitation and realizing these opportunities, and from concentrated growth and benefits to a more distributed growth and benefits, including to the hinterland, and from laying out the plans to actually executing the plans. I mean, some really interesting elements. Pascal Lamy is, as the um, Director General of the World Trade Organization and one who's been watching this region for many years, what are your observations as to the situation now and, and the key priorities for leaders going forward? Well, I think <coughs> looking at this region, uh, one sees a very good example of trade opening working for growth. It's obvious, the numbers are there. Whichever country within this region you look at, the lesson is the same for each country. And probably what's even more important is that it worked the same way during the crisis. The countries who are the most open in this region have been doing better during the crisis than the countries who are less open. So contrary to conventional wisdom, uh, trade opening does not increase vulnerability. It increases resilience. And I think it's a lesson that facts tell us, which I think doesn't always fit with uh, what people believe. I think the second uh, thing seen from the WTO is, uh, if you look at this region, is that, of course, bilateral uh, regional uh, 
economic integration works. There's been quite a, quite a lot of that, both within ASEAN and with the agreements uh, ASEAN uh, now has uh, uh, with India or China or Australia. But there is a limit to that, uh, which is that uh, a number of uh, shaping factors of trade and competitiveness uh, are out of reach of bilateral agreements. You cannot deal with uh, agricultural trade distorting subsidies bilaterally. You will not stop uh, subsidizing your bilateral chicken and uh, keep subsidizing your multilateral chicken. There's not much difference between a bilateral chicken and a multilateral chicken. Uh, you will not discipline uh, fishery subsidies uh, that lead to overfishing bilaterally. The only way to do that is multilaterally. You're not going to uh, increase uh, disciplines on uh, anti-dumping investigations bilaterally. The only way to do that is multilaterally. So, again, there is a virtue in regional economic integration, but a number of these issues can only be dealt with multilaterally, which is why they still deserve a lot of attention. And this is true, including, for instance, with trade facilitation, where the economies of scales of a multilateral agreement on customs procedure streamlining are huge as compared to what you can do bilaterally. Uh, third and last uh, point I'd like to uh, mention at this stage uh, is that this region also exemplifies uh, the importance of trade capacity building. Uh, if you look at the various levels of development uh, you have within this region, uh, including countries like uh, Laos, who's uh, working hard to join the WTO, with countries like uh, Singapore, who've been uh, there for a long time. Trade capacity building can make a big difference, whether or not proper regulation of international trade translates into growth and employment. Mm -hmm. And that's true for infrastructures, of course, and you all have this in mind, energy, transport, uh, telecoms. But it's also true for softer infrastructures, uh, such as uh, know-how, for instance. This country, Vietnam, uh, did a lot, for instance, in trying to upgrade its capacity to match uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards on seafood or on fruit, on vegetables. Now, whether there is a tariff or not, may not be of much a difference if you cannot match a EU or US or Japanese sanitary or phytosanitary standard. So moving in this direction, investing in this, is probably just as crucial as it is in infrastructures. And of course, uh, lastly, uh, and that connects with the discussion uh, we just had uh, previously and which you mentioned, uh, whether these trade-generated growth translates in a visible way for the people can also make a big difference. And this takes us to the sort of uh, benefit sharing, uh, growth and uh, justice, which you mentioned, which I believe by experience, the countries who have this capacity to share the benefits of growth have usually more support for trade opening than the ones who do not have it. So if we are serious about consolidating this system, again, which has shown, including the crisis, that that's the right way to go, there is an issue also in uh, uh, domestic uh, legitimization, which has to do uh, with justice at the end of the day. In fact, I think the Prime Minister of Thailand, in his remarks, actually underlined the importance of, of this right right from, from the get-go. Let's open it up uh, briefly now to, to, to the floor. What I'd like people to do is introduce themselves, and this is 
What are the key takeaways? What are the priorities for Asia's leaders coming out of this? And in about 30 seconds each, please, if I could have the microphone for the gentleman in, in front here. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre Lehmann, IMD. This is a question directed to Minister Pangestu, uh, if I may. Uh, Mary, at luncheon you spoke a good deal about ASEAN and the FTA, so contributing to the noodle bowl uh, of uh, trade. Uh, knowing that you're one of the few trade ministers who's actually an expert on trade, uh, and also that Indonesia is the only country from ASEAN that's on the G20, what I'd like to know, and I'm sure Pascal would also, is how is Indonesia going to ensure that the G20 holds to its commitment made in Pittsburgh to complete the Doha round this year? Wow. That's an excellent question. <laughs> that is, that is a <laughs> Well, uh, it's, it, we, we certainly will, uh, I think what's most important is to continue the commitment. I think we, we are realistic uh, about uh, setting deadlines again, but I think to continue the commitment uh, and to continue the process is still very important. We all know uh, the, the constraints uh, that we are under. It's not about uh, not doing it. I think it's more about, when, about timing. Uh, and we must continue until the timing is right. And the timing, I think, some of us, depends whether you're optimistic or, or pessimistic, uh, some of us think that it can, be, uh, it can be as soon as next year that there can be the momentum uh, to push this uh, further. Uh, but what's important is that the process continues. <coughs> uh, and it has to be at all levels, including at the leadership level. So uh, what we would like uh, in terms of from an Indonesian perspective as a member of G20, uh, we would definitely like to have a, se a session uh, in the G20 discussions that focuses on trade because we know the importance of trade. I think all of us uh, on this panel today have talked about the importance of trade uh, and trade uh, has been and will continue to be important uh, as a source of growth. Uh, some, a lot of people have referred to uh, trade uh, in the global crisis and in the recovery as the lowest cost stimulus. You know, you don't have to come up with any uh, budgetary expenditures, uh, but yet uh, it's contributing to growth uh, in, in a very uh, low cost way. So I think that that, uh, that is still very important and it's still very key uh, going forward uh, in terms of maintaining the recovery. And uh, that the WTO, as Pascal was saying earlier, is the only uh, forum where you're gonna be able to deal with some of the sensitive issues. You know, it's, it, it won't happen in, in the regionals. Uh, for instance, in agriculture, which is uh, one of the key uh, points of importance for developing countries, uh, to be able to uh, remove the uh, agriculture export subsidies and, and domestic support so that uh, agriculture prices are not uh, repressed and you have the incentive to increase production of agriculture and productivity, that's very key to the food security uh, debate, for instance. So uh, we will definitely uh, uh, be prioritizing that there be a discussion to maintain the political commitment at the leadership level, which we, we hope will filter down, uh, obviously, to the ministers and to the negotiators. And I think the other aspect, obviously, in the Pittsburgh statement is uh, ensuring uh, we, we do not, uh, uh, what, what we have been successful is to, main, to have benign protectionism. Uh, come out as, as sort of one of the fallouts of the global crisis, but it's been uh, kept more or less uh, in check, uh, and I don't think we have found any, anything that has violated uh, WTO rules. So we need to also maintain uh, the commitment for standstill uh, on protectionist measures and continued, I think, the exercise which has been very useful uh, of transparency and uh, self, what is it called? Self-declaration, is it? self-declaration of what you're doing uh, in terms of policies. But I think the final thing I would say is that uh, what we have also learned uh, in terms of trade issues, while we recognize the importance of trade issues uh, and uh, opening, continuing to have opening uh, of markets, open markets uh, and flows of trade and investment, uh, is the reality that unemployment rates are still high uh, in, in many countries. And even in countries in, like Indonesia where we actually, our unemployment rate actually went down slightly last year. Uh, the issue of uh, does trade uh, have gains for the country in question? Does it create jobs? Uh, what about the affected sectors that, that are there? 
uh, what do you do, uh, what are the uh, uh, compensation schemes, uh, how do you deal uh, with the transition? These are real questions uh, which come into the realm of capacity building. It comes in the realm of having a good discussion on it. It's about retraining or uh, skills, increasing the skill level uh, of your labor force. Uh, and it's about aid for trade, uh, which can be packaged uh, as a complement uh, to what we are doing uh, in the Doha round. If I may complement your information, uh, Jean-Pierre, Indonesia is not the only country of the region which is sitting around the table of the G20. There is one chair for Indonesia, and there is one chair for the chair of ASEAN, which last year <coughs> was the Thai Prime Minister, and this year will be uh, the Prime Minister of Vietnam. So there are two seats as there are three seats for Africa, one for Egypt, one for South Africa, and one for the African Union, just as a matter of complete information. Talking a bit about issue, issues of, of fact with a, with a trade issue, you, you mentioned the fact that some of the more open economies actually bounce back most quickly. The fact that trade after contract is actually expanding, so very different than, than the, the Great Depression that way. Is it also true that ASEAN indeed globally actually net-net liberalized during this period because of actually keeping to existing commitments? Right. Overall, worldwide, uh, trade is uh, as open uh, today as it was in uh, 08, with a bit of pluses and a bit of minuses. Now, this is also true in this region, uh, although Overall, this region has more erred on the positive than on the negative. Thanks notably to uh, countries like Malaysia, who during the crisis have uh, kept opening trade. Now, Indonesia is a country where there has been a bit of debate. Uh, Mari has uh, been very firm and successful until now. And I hope she'll be successful in the future. Uh, but so overall, this region uh, is probably slightly more open today than it was in 08. Which is remarkable. Yeah. It's actually come well, through the biggest recession in the last 60 years, more open than before, and with the, the growth coming from that. One of the issues that was raised and actually came out in the last couple of days was the incredibly important issue of skills and training both to deal with, with changes, but also in, in terms of upgrading the, the value added economy. Franz, did you want to give us a, a sense of what you heard on, on the, the skills gap challenge? Um, more than happy to do so. Um, <coughs> if I uh, keep it a little bit uh, pragmatical, um, we talked a lot about uh, the total food value chains eh, with all the challenges we have in mind. We have to produce 50% more, the population is growing. Um, and we have also to look at the type of quality we produce and the quantities we produce of which commodities. And this is for, um, if I look at the base, the people really, who really have to do the work, which is the, the small-scale farmer, uh, and we talk about how we make that information available to them, then we talk about the training program, which is not only um, very in the basic needed, but also in the scale and in the speed. And I think um, I'm fully with uh, Ibu Marie when she says we know what to do, but we have to make it now uh, uh, actions and, uh, and actionable uh, measurements. Then we talk also about training and skills, and this throughout the total value chain. We talked uh, quite in detail about this uh, on the Vietnam value chain for food, where we, uh, we, we trade here ourselves, both for our local operations but also for exports. And you see the enormous opportunities, which is sometimes a frustration because you see great products with great value, which both for the domestic market uh, are beautiful, but also for Europe exports. So you have a lot of value in your hands. The only thing is sometimes you cannot touch it in the right uh, quality. So you have to work on training, that people are aware of the opportunities. Then we talk about international quality standards, for example. Uh, then we talk about a new te technology, how to produce or how to increase the productivity per hectares. And you talk about seeds, and you talk about fertilizers, and you talk about water irrigation. You talk about cold chain and how to get the products uh, as, as safe and as, as fast as possible onto the market. You talk about an honest market access for those small farmers and taking out partners in the distribution chain who do not add value. 
And all these kind of things are visible, and I think we know what to do. I think the key word is here, um, the, the accelerate, accelerated training and the scale of the volume, otherwise it might take 20 years before you have trained a, a population of 500 million farmers in this region. Uh, so we have to do this together. And the second key word is collaboration. Collaboration in the total value chain with the public sector, the private sector, NGOs uh, can gi also give an, 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 uh, a good contribution there. And I think if we coordinate this, and it's exactly the working group working on this now here in Vietnam under the leadership of uh, Minister Fat, I think then we have a great future ahead. And we cannot let this go. And uh, we have a unique opportunity. And coming back in Davos in February, uh, we have to come with a concrete plan on the table and also the first results. And I'm quite confident this will come. An action-oriented panel we have here. Other key questions or comments in terms of what are the priorities for ASEAN's leaders coming out of this? Let me then actually take up one of the points that was raised in terms of the number of, or the increased number of uh, ASEAN representatives on the G20. In fact, if we look at Asia as a whole, it goes from one-eighth of the G8 to almost one-third of the G20. That's a massive opportunity. Asia's wanted to be at the table, Asia's at the table. What effect is that going to have on what's discussed around the table and what comes out in terms of substance, in terms of maybe even style? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about the shift of gravity uh, towards Asia uh, in, in, in the, and it was accelerated uh, with the global crisis. So this economic uh, uh, shift uh, towards East uh, Asia, especially. Uh, uh, with greater economic uh, representation should come greater responsibility. Uh, and uh, it turns out that, yes, we, we are all, as you said, six members of uh, G G20 are coming from East Asia. Uh, but I think wh what is important, what we have found, is that individually, uh, East Asian countries uh, have not been able, have not uh, yet uh, been able to play this, you know, greater role in terms mm -hmm. of the international governance, in terms of contributing to the international uh, architecture, whether it's uh, trade, whether it's uh, financial architecture, whether it's World Bank or IMF and so on. But yet, uh, the most recent Euro, Eurozone uh, crisis informs us that uh, we are not out of the woods yet in the sense that we are still in an interdependent world. Uh, and issues such as uh, financial safety nets, issues such as how to deal uh, what, what uh, G20 was effective in, uh, concerted uh, stimulus helped us to uh, prevent a Great Depression. Now uh, the, the question is still out there, uh, whether it's concerted exit, whether it's how to do uh, in a coordinated way the balanced, inclusive, sustained growth strategy. Uh, and to continue uh, the issues that are still there on the financial reforms. Uh, and uh, as we just talked about earlier, the trade issue definitely still should still be on the agenda. So I think the question, uh, if you uh, ask the question, how should East Asia play a greater role in voicing uh, all these concerns uh, in the G20? Uh, I think there are several ideas out there. Uh, one is that because individually it seems uh, even for the large, larger uh, East Asian countries, they have not really uh, come up to the challenge of taking this greater responsibility. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we did it collectively as East Asia, uh, then uh, it, it, you know, how do we coordinate uh, and co cooperate amongst each other uh, to be able to uh, have the East Asia voice? And there are a number of ideas uh, out there uh, as to how we would do that. Uh, I think one, uh, obviously because of the ASEAN representation, we do talk about G20 issues in the ASEAN meetings, and we also have the East Asia Summit, which is uh, all the East Asia, uh, all the six, I believe, all the six are involved uh, in that process. And we also have uh, East Asia plus three finance ministers <coughs> process, uh, and so on and so forth. So how this must be connected uh, to uh, contributing to two things, I think to ensuring uh, that the issues of developing countries and East Asia are on the table in the discussions in G20. Uh, and second, uh, that we must be represented uh, in, in any one of the number of uh, global governance, uh, global governance uh, 
systems that are out there. Uh, we, we do now have uh, the managing director uh, of, of the World Bank. Uh, one of the managing directors of the World Bank is from Indonesia. Uh, and I think uh, the chief economist of the World Bank is from China, and I believe the IMF also now has, uh, is it, what do you call him, a vice, uh, a vice di director uh, uh, who is from Japan. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, for, I th I, my final point would be that, uh, there, you know, there is a little bit of distinction within East Asia. For the smaller, uh, middle-sized uh, East Asian countries like Korea, uh, Indonesia and Australia to some extent. We are in a situation where we've done everything right, you know, in the sense that after the East Asian financial crisis, we reformed, we did all the right things, we, did, we had macro discipline, et cetera, et cetera, but yet we did get hit by the crisis. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it does mean that we must <laughs> make sure that uh, we, we, we are not going to be affected again because it, despite doing all the right things, we still punished, uh, if you like, and we do not want to be in that position. So we would like to be able to have a say in, in how to reduce such vulnerabilities uh, in the future. I mean, which is a, a fascinating, from actually being the center of the crisis in 97, to actually being one of the poles of relative stability in 2008, to actually being part of the solution going forward is a very interesting progression. And Pascal, I mean, what would you be hoping to see in terms of ASEAN or, or Asian influence on both the, the substance or the style of what will be going on in the G20? Well, if, I mean, if you compare the G8 and the G20, uh, there is one common concept, which is a sort of hanging together. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that you've got much more people hanging together in the G20 than you have in the G8. And that creates a sort of rebalancing difference. What they all have in common is the notion, the perception that the reason why they are around this table is because they are hanging together. And of course, uh, the huge rebal geopolitical rebalancing, uh, which happened because of the crisis, uh, the sort of occasion where people have been talking years and years and years that G8 was too small, huh? but it only happened because of the crisis. Uh, there is a virtue in this sort of shock. Now, what does not change, to be very frank, uh, is that uh, all the leaders around this table, except for international organizations, remain obsessed by their national domestic constituency. This is the only real accountability they have. There is no electoral premium or benefit uh, for international cooperation. It doesn't get you one vote. And these people, by definition, are the champions uh, who've been uh, selected in a very tough domestic power fighting process. So that's what they mind about. And this will not change. Now, of course, the good thing is that at least once or twice a year, they have to think about what they are going to say to their colleagues in the G20. So it's a sort of, the message is more important than the message, which is, which is why, in a way, the start. one shouldn't expect too much from the G20. Uh, it's going to be exactly the same as with the G8. You will have big declarations, and many people will say, mm -hmm, not much of that has happened. It's not like domestic governance, assuming in, gov in domestic governance there is no discrepancy between uh, declarations and realizations, which I think also might be qualified. And, and, and what about the, the, the question of Asian leadership, not just at the government level, in the manifestation of ASEAN and G20, but actually Asian business leadership? And uh, Neymar, you've, you've actually 
are, are part of, of the Tata group that's gone in the last five years from being primarily focused on India with some international operations to now, I believe, being majority uh, of, of revenues coming from outside of India. What do you see in, in terms of the leadership agenda or Asia's leadership agenda from the perspective of business leadership? When it comes to business leadership, I think the principles across the globe are gradually becoming same. It's not that we have some different principles to operate the business in Asia and rest of the developed world. What changes, of course, is aspects of corporate social responsibility in a developing countries is quite different than what you will have in a developed country. The issues are different. So that's one major difference and the, when we discuss with our colleagues this particular aspect, the importance of various things are quite different than what they are. Uh, let's say in India or it, our operations in Thailand or in India, the issues are quite similar, but operations in Singapore or in Netherlands or in UK, the issues will be different. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when it comes to, let's say, manpower productivity or let's say the amount of hours one is willing to put in for the bottom line or for the better results. The attitude towards the work ba balance life, work uh, uh, family balance life, that I think there are different attitudes and that's something one has to get used to. Mm -hmm. Because again, in the developing countries, people tend to put the family life or the personal life little on the back seat, just to improve the bottom line of the corporations. On the other hand, you will see that the work-life balance in developed nations is considered quite important by the people, which is also quite understandable. But this appreciation between the two needs to be understood well. Very interesting. Let me open it up now to the audience again on the issue of the, the uh, key priorities for, for Asian leaders, both in terms of what's come out in terms of the priorities for the region itself, but also the priorities that Asia's, Asia's leaders, corporate or political, may be taking internationally. Any comments, any questions for, for the panel from the audience? Please. Thank you. I think I speak too much today, but I feel like since nobody raised their hand, so this is my opportunity. Um, my name is, uh, is Wang. I am a director of local NGO here in Vietnam. Um, and I have a comment, but uh, like comment for discussion among the panel about the, um, the leadership of Asia. We are in, here in the World Economic Forum, and when we, we think about economic, we think about money, basically. Um, and it seemed like we, when we discussed about Asia, Rome, we discussed about the capital, financial capital, and the growth, economic growth. Uh, but I think the Asian speciality is not only about money and not only about the Vietnamese food or the sushi or, or the Indian food, but the, the, the specialties that Asia can offer is uh, also the social harmony. So I'm talking about something that money cannot buy, but money uh, can help to strengthen, to produce. So um, it is about inclusive development. We <coughs> hear, hear a lot about the money and economic growth, but I haven't heard enough about the inclusive development, that how Asia can develop, but make sure that we take care of the social issue, we take care of underprivileged population, that we are not end up one day like the United States today, that left 40% of the population having no health insurance, and after be become a, such a superpower and economic, the, the, the American have to go back and, and debate about, about health care issue for their population. So I would really much appreciate the panel to comment on that. Thank you. If you recall, I did mention in my opening remarks that there is an issue of the haves and have-nots, and if we don't do enough for the poorer people in terms of education, in terms of means of livelihood and means of 
at least some basic facilities like water, etc., pure drinking water, the social harmony will not be there. And this is absolutely true. And I have personally experienced it in certain occasions. And for that matter, I will certainly vote that unless we do this well, we will always have some disharmony in terms of some social unrest or some extremist elements coming in, whatever way disruptive elements will come in, it will happen. So that's a danger in front of all of us if we don't follow it. And here, it's not only the corporate, it's not only, the, uh, the corporates cannot take a view that only government should do this. It has to be a joint effort. And if we don't do this well, I don't think the sustainable development, what we are talking for last two, three days, will happen. I mean, you are absolutely right, and that has to be done in that particular way. Yeah, I can also comment from my side on this. Um, I think uh, if you talk about a uh, sustainable business relationship, we're not only talking about money. Uh, we're talking about uh, how we can grow with our supplier base, how we can grow with our employee base, and then you talk about education, and then you talk about healthcare, and you talk about pension, and you talk about training, you talk about standards, of ELO, ELO standards uh, in, in the labor organization for our own people, BSCI standard, for example, in the production of goods. Um, and I think uh, serious companies uh, with a long-term view have also these kind of perspective uh, in their code of conduct or in their way of doing business. And the more we can uh, have this also as a standard in the industry, I think then we also will bring this, uh, this to the markets where you're talking about. And for example, your for ex uh, example of Vietnam, uh, we trained here in, in Vietnam uh, 19,000 farmers um, just to make sure that they get a better living. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I think there you have a good relationship with the farmers. Uh, they, they, get, uh, they get also yeah, a, a better level of income we train them, we make sure that also their business is getting better and more sustainable, that they also uh, get into the market. And on the other hand, working with specific standards, that we also have social standards in our, in our compendium, which we also would like to make. So it fits together, and I, th I think for a lot of international companies, it's very high on the agenda to make sure that we don't get the gap you just, uh, you just described. Mario Pascal, any yeah. comments on this or any other closing comments? I, th I think... Uh, there are different models of uh, social inclusiveness on this planet, obviously. And many of you have in your mind the sort of Western uh, model, uh, which is uh, sort of top-down, uh, tax policy, uh, public expenditure, uh, education, uh, health, which usually fits with a model where the proportion of public expenditure to GNP is uh, reasonably high. Now, if you look at this region, it's a different pattern. It's more, that's my own personal experience, it's more a sort of bottom-up inclusiveness than top-down inclusiveness. If you take India, Indonesia, Vietnam, these are three countries where civil society is uh, much more vibrant on average than it is in the Western world. There's a lot of civil society engagement, activeness, uh, activity, activism <coughs> on areas like uh, education, uh, 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 maternal health, uh, children, care, uh, food, to take areas which now are sort of included in public systems uh, in Europe, uh, the US, or, or even Japan. So there's not one single model, and I think this region has a, a capacity of a sort of bottom-up pressured inclusiveness that should not be uh, underestimated. Good. Uh, I think this, it's a very big question, but I think for uh, speaking f sort of from the ground level uh, as, as a decision maker that had to go through a number of uh, crises in the last five years and how do you make sure that the most vulnerable groups uh, in your society don't uh, really uh, become more vulnerable. Uh, we had the tsunami, we had the food crisis, and then we had the global crisis. 
I think we learned a lot about uh, how to manage our fiscal, uh, the limit, if you have limited resources, how do you uh, channel it so that you have better targeted uh, subsidy programs uh, that directly uh, will get to the people that, that needs help. Uh, and and th we went through a, a lot of this, and I think the takeaway from that is basically to, to understand uh, which groups in society you really want to help. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you do have to have the statistics and the verification uh, for it. Uh, and we use the post office, actually, as a delivery mechanism uh, for the cash transfer, and it turned out that it was very effective. Uh, and uh, we, we continue to use it for some of the other uh, programs. Uh, and I think, I believe India uh, also and Brazil uh, use the post office. So it can be very simple. Uh, it doesn't have to be very sophisticated, but it can reach uh, the, the people that you need to reach. Uh, and I think the, the other area, perhaps, I'm sure uh, World Economic Forum has um, uh, developed this. We found that uh, after the East Asian financial crisis and even during this current global crisis, you, you uh, in fact had people who lost jobs ended up becoming entrepreneurs. Yeah. And some of them were social, what, we, what you would call social entrepreneurs. Uh, and here is where the role of microfinance, the role of uh, whether it's CS, CSR or linking uh, to, the, uh, to the more uh, modern firms, I think become uh, a very important way to answer uh, some of the inclusiveness issue. I think my last point would be uh, given our uh, collective gender here. Uh, I think uh, inclusive to me also means equal access for women, for education, uh, for programs. Uh, you know, when we, we have lots of examples. Whenever there's a program that's uh, for community-based development, uh, you don't let the men decide because they'll, uh, they'll end up deciding if you have to choose between water uh, and a parabola to connect you to the world, they will choose the parabola, not the water, you know, uh, et cetera. And uh, empirically speaking, women are less corrupt <laughs> than men, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, my, the girl effect uh, session that I was at in Davos, mm -hmm. that was kind of very eye-opening for me that if you target uh, teenage girls between 13 to 18 and make sure they get education, they get equal access uh, to uh, opportunities for uh, economic activity, you will reduce poverty. I think that's a very powerful number. So I think to me, inclusiveness also has a gender dimension. Thank you. Well, and in fact, uh, th this, this discussion on key priorities for Asian leaders ended up exactly where all these conversations should be beginning, which is what's the impact on the human beings. Yeah. And we've covered uh, an immense uh, number of areas building on the incredible progress and resilience of this region compared to even 10 years ago. But the real set of challenges going forward, obviously, these are key conversations, key initiatives that we should be continuing to look at. And in terms of how we go forward with this, I would just like to uh, turn over to Ibu Marie to, to make an, an announcement and an invitation about how we take these conversations go forward. Thank you. Uh, clearly, we haven't finished our conversation. That's why we need to continue our conversation. I think that was the, uh, the conclusion just made. Uh, and we have a very nice place for you to continue the conversation. Jakarta, Indonesia, June 12th to 13th, 2011. Uh, and we do hope uh, that all of you will come. Uh, I think we are uh, in, in a situation, a good situation, where uh, we are discussing lots of opportunities and there's a sense of optimism that I've picked up uh, in the last two days. Uh, but yet to sustain, I think, uh, the, the uh, center of growth stories that we have been talking about, the pool of that young, dynamic talent that we have uh, in this region, we need to not just continue our conversation next year, but, uh, you know, when you, when you call yourselves a working group, you really have to work, right? <laughs> you have to work, and uh, hopefully, you know, we are already in the how to achieve a number of things uh, kind of stage, and we do hope that uh, in, in between now and uh, June 12, 13, 2011, there will be other working groups uh, that will bring its results uh, uh, to, to uh, Jakarta uh, next year. We look forward to uh, seeing all of you uh, in Jakarta, Indonesia, to tell you more about the Indonesian story and uh, the ASEAN story. Uh, and on, on, on the ASEAN note, I'd like to thank uh, the Vietnamese government for uh, this excellent uh, uh, East Asia World Economic Forum that we've all been attending for the last two days. I think it's been an excellent forum. It will make, make it uh, hard, 
act for us to follow next year. Uh, we've all been carefully taking notes as to you know, how we can continue this conversation with all of you next year uh, with hopefully uh, results that will be ensuring that we will have inclusive growth. Thank you. Well. So this will be a particularly special, that will be our 20th anniversary East Asia Summit, our working economic forum that we'll be uh, doing together in Jakarta. I'd just like to remind you in terms of the continuing the conversation, we have our summer Davos, September 13th to 15th in, in Tianjin, which is looking at the global issues through the Asian lens. And then of course, in India, November 14th to 16th, where a number of these issues on agriculture, on logistics, working with social partners in terms of issues of justice and accessibility, will be continued so that when we have our conversation in, in June in Jakarta, we'll be able to see the progress we've made together. And now is, is for me to thank, on behalf of uh, Professor Swab and the World Economic Forum, the government and the people of Vietnam and of Ho Chi Minh City for their extraordinary support over the last couple of days, but frankly over the last year in terms of making this an extraordinary event. And I'd also like to ask Sushan to stand up for just a moment. I'd like to, to recognize Sushant and the hardworking team for all that they've done. And finally, I'd like to thank you, because in fact, it's bringing together this group in a sense of community that makes the World Economic Forum unique. Thank you very much, and safe return. Thank you.